Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Ann Oliva. I am the director of the Office of Homeless Assistance Programs. With me today, I have Laura Rout, my deputy director of the SNAPS office. And we want to welcome you to the first broadcast in a series of broadcasts designed to roll out the new Continuum of Care program and to provide critical information on the 2012 Continuum of Care competition. Over the coming weeks, we will be releasing documents like the regulation itself, the 2012 registration notice, the NOFA, and technical assistance documents, with broadcasts scheduled in between the release of those documents to explain the nuances that are included in the documents, as well as to provide some context to the readers. We will also be providing information on how the various program regulations relate both to each other and how the Continuum of Care regulation relates to and impacts the 2012 competition. As I mentioned in the 2011 debriefing broadcast, which I hope that you have had the opportunity to take a look at, and if you haven't, I would suggest you go back and do so, I really want to provide you some comfort that while there really is a lot of information coming out uh, in these various documents that HUD is releasing, Many of the major concepts discussed in the regulation and in the competition are the same or similar as concepts that we have had in the past. For example, in the past we used the terminology hold harmless need, and that was really to used to determine uh, the renewal demand for your supportive housing program grants. This year, however, we are using new terminology with a similar concept, and that is renewal demand. Renewal demand includes both the supportive housing program and the Shelter Plus Care program. So you can see it seems like new terminology, but the concept itself is quite similar to what we've done in the past. In addition to formalizing through the regulation the concepts that we use to operate our programs and the competition, I think that we can all be excited to learn more about um, and actually implement the new tools to prevent and end homelessness that are provided for in the McKinney-Vento Act as amended by the Hearth Act. For example, we now have the ability to fund rapid rehousing programs in the Continuum of Care program and in ESG. We have options for coordinated or centralized intake and assessment. We have formalized decision-making tools and funding to pay for planning. Those are all new, exciting things that we're going to talk about briefly today, but in much more detail over the coming weeks. The rollout we have planned is really designed to provide you with the information you need to focus on at a given point in the right order. So we know that you're going to have questions, but I would urge you to please read the regulations and the preamble and listen to the broadcasts in the right order before sending lots of questions to the help desk. And remember that while we are operating the 2012 competition under the new rules, you have some time to think about and digest these rules before they actually begin to impact projects. The rules themselves do not start to impact projects or be effective for projects until January of 2013. So all currently funded projects will operate under the regulations that are attached to your grant agreement. And beginning in January of 2013, as we renew projects through the 2012 competition, the new rules will begin to apply. And last, uh, on a somewhat somber note, before we get started, I want to note that the 2012-2013 uh, year, competition years, are looking like they're going to be tough uh, from a budget perspective. We know that funds will be limited for new activities, and we are not implementing uh, the, maximi the maximum authorized amounts or cost increases that are authorized in the Hearth Act. We strongly encourage continuums to be strategic and use the tools that we are providing you, like reallocation, to make strategic decisions about the types of projects that are being funded in your community. And I want to point out that this perspective isn't just coming from HUD, it's also coming from Congress. Um, a recent House Appropriations Report has also taken notice of the types of projects that are being renewed and the need for strategic thinking. And that report reads in part, 
It is not the committee's intention to maintain an entitlement program for ailing and inflexible service providers. The committee reminds providers in the continuum of care that these funds are intended to assist and house the homeless as effectively and efficiently as possible. So with that kind of language um, in the House report, I think it's important for you all to know that in the coming months, we will be releasing tools not only to help you understand the regulations, but really to help drive local decisions and conversations about resources and how to continue to improve our efficiency and effectiveness so that we can serve people who are homeless and prevent and end homelessness at the community level. So with that, let's get into today's presentation. The purpose of today's broadcast is to provide you with a big picture overview of how the HEARTH Act is being implemented by HUD and to provide you information about what this means for uh, recipients of HUD's homeless assistance funds. We will provide an overview of the structure of the interim continuum of care regulation. We hope that this will help facilitate your understanding of the rule as you read it on your own. It will be critical that recipients and subrecipients of continuum of care program funds understand the requirements set forth in the rule and that this rule will guide 2012 continuum of care program competition. Next, we'll discuss a few key concepts from the interim rule. This section will be fairly short and is really intended only to provide you with those concepts that you will need to understand for our discussion of the 2012 continuum of care competition. Additional broadcasts, webinars, and technical assistance materials will provide more detailed information about the key terms that can be found in the regulations, but are not all discussed today. Then we'll provide an overview of the 2012 Continuum of Care competition. This portion of the presentation is, in is intended only to give you a sense of what is to come over the next several months as HUD works to help communities apply for and administer grants awarded in the 2012 Continuum Program competition. Again, additional materials and broadcasts will go through the details. And finally, at the end of today's presentation, we'll provide you with a list of additional resources that will reinforce the information presented in today's broadcast. As you all know, the HEARTH Act was signed into law on May 20th, 2009, and it reauthorized and amended the McKinney-Vento Act. That's why we call it the McKinney-Vento Act as amended by the HEARTH Act. As a reminder, HUD has developed six sets of regulations to implement HEARTH, and all but one, the Rural Housing Stability Assistance Program, has been posted for your review. Specifically, I'll walk through all the, all the different regulations. The homeless definition was published as a final rule on December 5th, 2011. It applied to the HEARTH Act's definition of homeless for the SHP and Shelter Plus Care programs. The same definition of homeless has been incorporated into all of the programs authorized by the HEARTH Act, ESG, Continuum of Care, and the Rural Housing Stability Assistance Program. Additionally, it applied to the Consolidated Plan regulations. The Emergency Solutions Grants and ConPlan regulations were published as interim on December 5th, 2011 as well. It is in effect for all recipients of the second allocation of FY 2011 funds, as well as for the FY 2012 ESG funds. HUD is in the process of reviewing public comments that were received on this regulation and is preparing the final regulation. The HMIS regulation uh, was proposed on December 9th. HUD has received approximately 80 comments on the HMIS regulation and is in the process also of reviewing the comments and preparing the final rule. Until the rule is published, users of HMIS should continue to use the standards in place to administer their HMIS systems, that is the 2010 data standards and the 2004 notice on technical standards. The rural housing stability Regulation will be forthcoming shortly, and we will provide additional information on that when it, was, when it is released for public comment. Let's quickly review the purpose of the HEARTH Act as stated in the Act itself. The first purpose really was to codify in federal law the continuum of care planning process as a required and necessary local function, really to, to help us get to preventing and ending homelessness in the long run. This actually comes out of the Act itself, and it gets to the importance of having a formalized continuum of care to make decisions at the local level. 
The act also says that the purpose is to establish a federal goal of ensuring that individuals and families who become homeless return to permanent housing within 30 days. This is an aggressive goal. Uh, I think that you know, with all of the planning and uh, strategic thinking that we have potentially going forward, this is a, an achievable goal, but it is certainly a purpose of the HEARTH Act. The HEARTH Act also states that um, the purpose is to provide clarification on the terms that we generally use to describe people who are experiencing homelessness. And we did provide this clarification already via the final rule on the definition of homelessness that was published in December and that became effective in January. It's important to note as we go forward that HUD is a key partner in the implementation of Opening Doors, the federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness. The goals that are set forth in the federal strategic plan really helped to guide the policies that are reflected in the regulation itself. And you'll see if you were to look at both documents next to each other that they are, um, that they closely reflect each other in terms of policy drivers. It also helps us to determine our policy priorities included in the annual NOFA. That is, when we think about where we want to spend our money, we look to the federal strategic plan to really understand how funds should be targeted at the national and local levels. So next, we're going to shift to walking through the regulation itself, and I'm going to turn it to Laura Rout to start us off. Thank you, Anne. It should be noted that the Continuum of Care does several things. It comp combines our three current competitive programs, the Supportive Housing Program, the Section 8 Moderate Rehabilitation Single Room Occupancy SRO Program, that's a mouthful, and Shelter Plus Care into one single grant program. The Continuum of Care program allows for all of the activities previously funded under these programs and adds some new eligible activities while increasing administrative efficiencies at both the local and national levels. It is important to note that the HEARTH Act actually repealed the SRO program. Existing projects can be renewed through the same process, but no new Section 8 Mod Rehab grants which provide Section 8 vouchers will be awarded. The rental assistance and rehabilitation activities are included under the Continuum of Care program. Although we have discussed some of these matters in previous trainings and technical assistance materials, we will continue to discuss this and other activities and issues in future broadcasts. The Continuum of Care is, is titled uh, as Title III under the HEARTH Act, and it has five purposes. As to be expected, the program is asking for there to be a community-wide commitment to ending homelessness. The program will provide funds for state and local governments and nonprofits to quickly rehouse homeless persons. This will, in turn, minimize the trauma and dislocation caused to homeless persons and communities by homelessness. The program promotes access to effective use of mainstream programs by the homeless families and individuals. COC should be working with, with mainstream service providers to develop strategies that will en enable homeless persons to better access their services. Also to note, it, uh, the program also optimizes self-sufficiency among homeless individuals and families. And this has always been a goal of our programs and through this program it will continue. One of the best things about this program is that it codifies the continuum of care structure and process into law. HUD began implementing the COC process in 1995 through the NOFA. Each year, the NOFA guided the development of COCs and encouraged communities to work together to address homelessness in a coordinated manner. Additionally, HUD published user guides, frequently asked questions, and other technical assistance materials which assisted communities to develop effective COCs, but often meant that information was scattered and not easily located. The COC program regulation changes this. Finally, the COC program provides funding to support the COC's planning and organizing, something communities have been doing for years without funding. 
While a budget will not allow for full funding provided in the act and the regulations, as we will discuss later in this broadcast, HUD is committed to providing communities with much needed funds to support this critical process in our attempt to end homelessness nationwide. When the HEARTH Act was passed, HUD intended to release the regulations together as each of the rules rely in some part on, on another rule. Unfortunately, to, uh, due to a variety of factors, HUD was not able to release all of them together. As Ann mentioned, when the FY 2011 Appropriations Act required that the Emergency Solutions Grant Program be funded under that program, HUD turned its attention to releasing the interim ESG regulation even though a large portion of the program's coordination and administration relied upon the continuum of care. With the continuum of care program's release, the final piece of the puzzle comes together and programs can begin to work in tandem more effectively as was originally intended under the, the HEARTH Act. The continuum of care, which is which more will be, it will be discussed more uh, later in the discussion, and it is intended to be coordinating body of the emergency solutions grant um, recipients and COC funds awarded within the claimed geographic area. It is also meant to be involved and often lead to coordination of all other housing and services for homeless persons within its geographic area. This should include mainstream services that are not dedicated to homeless persons, but can be used to support homeless persons. Additionally, the continuum of care is, is the body responsible for establishing and operating the HMIS and the centralized or coordinated assessment within its geographic area. On this slide, we, we just uh, are trying to pull out that this does formalize the establishment and operations of the HMIS and it also establishes as part of the CSC's responsibilities to set up, operate, or designate a centralized or coordinated assessment to be used in the, in the area. More information on this, on this issue will be discussed in future broadcasts and, and webinars. And now Ann will present the structure of the COC program rule. Thank you, Laura. Slides. The, regu the regulatory text for the continuum of care interim rule is preceded by a lengthy preamble. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this preamble before we start talking about how the rule is organized so you know what to look for. The preamble itself provides explanations and context, sometimes explaining why HUD made certain decisions um, and sometimes providing examples on how HUD intends communities to interpret the regulatory language. So that really is designed to help the reader understand HUD's point of view and walk through the, regula the regulatory text itself, which because it's legal in nature is somewhat uh, difficult to read. So I would suggest that you read them together, both the preamble sort of next to the regulatory text. I'd like to point out that there are a few places where we specifically ask for comment. And I would encourage you to submit comments on the COC rule, especially in those places where we request it. If we are requesting it, it is because we really want to see exactly how the community feels about implementing a specific provision um, so that HUD can make sure that it is the best provision possible when we put out the final rule. And I also want to note that we take comments very seriously. We look at them very closely. We discuss them at length, and uh, I encourage you, again, to submit comments uh, on the COC rule to the extent that you can. As Laura mentioned, we also decided that we wanted to look in all the places where we provide guidance or instruction or regulation for these competitive programs and try and put them all into one place, and that place is the new continuum of care rule. And the rule itself is organized into seven subparts. Subpart A is the general provisions. Subpart B is establishing and operating a continuum of care. Subpart C is the application and grant award process. Subpart D discusses program components and costs. Subpart E is focused on high performing communities. Subpart F 
is program requirements. Subpart G is grant administration. Over the next several slides, we're going we're to review the basic information that is included in each of these subparts. As I mentioned at the start of this presentation, we're not going to go into great detail right now, but we're going to provide you and point you to the places in the regulation that you really need to understand in order to complete the grant inventory uh, worksheet process and the continuum of care registration process for the 2012 competition. Subpart A contains the purpose and scope of the continuum of care program and its definitions. In other words, it talks about what we want the program to do, what we want it to accomplish, and it defines the terms that are used throughout the document in one area of the, regula of the regulation itself. Some of those definitions are brand new, uh, and some are definitions that you'll be uh, familiar with from the past, and some are, again, similar concepts to what we've done in the past, but using the new terminology. Subpart B talks about the continuum of care itself. And this is really the first time the continuum of care structure itself is discussed in a regulation. And because it is now discussed in a regulation, not just in the notice of funding availability, uh, it means that it is subject to monitoring, which means that HUD can come out and monitor on any of the regulations, including how the continuum of care is um, established and operates. Specifically, it includes requirements for establishing the continuum of care, including the development of a board, which in the past we've called uh, the decision-making body or you know, that, that kind of terminology in the past. Uh, now we're calling it a board, and it is included as a requirement for establishing the continuum of care. It discusses the responsibilities of the continuum of care, including um, evaluating performance at the local level. It outlines the process for preparing an application for funds to HUD, as well as the process for being designated as a unified funding agency, and we'll talk about that in a moment. It also talks about remedial actions that HUD may take in the case that a continuum of care cannot or does not meet the criteria of a continuum of care in the act. I think a couple of important notes here to make is that the regulatory text and the preamble text both recognize that continuums of care currently exist in various forms and levels of formality. We are actually asking for comment on the continuum of care board structure in the preamble, and it really reflects HUD's value that continuums are inclusive, continue to be inclusive, that they're community-based, and that people who have experienced homelessness, either in the past or currently, be represented in decision-making groups uh, for the continuum of care. So those are important notes for you to, to be aware of. Subpart C contains uh, eligible applicants and the process for applying for and awarding funds, including the process for receiving a grant agreement after an applicant has been conditionally awarded funds and special provisions for new projects. So subpart C also contains the requirements for appealing funding decisions, which we never have had in regulation before. Um, either of those decisions made by the continuum of care, uh, made by the con plan jurisdiction, if a con plan jurisdiction chooses not to sign um, the con plan cert, and decisions made by HUD. I think it is especially important that uh, recipients and subrecipients review section 578.33 closely. That's the renewal section. Uh, this section provides HUD the authority to renew projects that include activities that were eligible under the supportive housing program, shelter plus care program, and section eight mod rehab programs, but are not specifically included in HEARTH. That may include uh, safe havens, for example. Safe havens are uh, allowed programs under the old SHP rules, but are not allowed, um, are not authorized in the Hearth Act statute. So, so that we don't close down safe haven programs, HUD uh, has written into the regulation basically a grandfathering clause. 
that uh, allows us to renew safe havens under the terms of their original, con of their original grant agreement um, for, for many years to come. There are other types of activities, including the ones that Laura mentioned under the uh, SRO program, that also can be renewed as long as they do not make uh, major changes to their program uh, moving forward. So in other words, renewals are being protected. Subpart D includes the standards and requirements for uh, program components and eligible costs. So these are all going to look very familiar to you. Uh, program components include permanent housing, which includes both permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing. So that's sort of, that's new. That's where we uh, decided rapid rehousing fit in the components section. It also includes transitional housing, supportive services only, HMIS, and uh, homelessness prevention, prevention for those HUD-designated high-performing communities, and we'll talk about high-performing communities in a moment. The eligible costs related to these components uh, will also look familiar, but added to those are the eligible costs related to continuum of care planning and unified funding agencies. Those are new. But the project level costs, again, will look familiar. They will look like line items out of your budget. That includes acquisition, new construction, rehabilitation, leasing, rental assistance, supportive services, which we took great pains to make as similar to ESG as possible and um, to match the Rural Housing Stability Assistance Program. Uh, includes operating, homeless management information systems, and uh, administration. Also, for the first time, uh, to, many of, to, to the delight of many, it will include indirect costs, and indirect costs are specifically outlined in the regulation. Subpart E is everything you ever wanted to know about high-performing communities, uh, including the standards that continuums must meet to apply to be designated as a high-performing community, the application process for HPCs, and the eligible activities that a recipient or a designated high-performing community may carry out. It's important to note here that in 2012, uh, we will not be implementing high-performing communities through the competition, uh, mostly related to you know, funding factors as well as to the fact that uh, the, the data that we would need to designate high-performing communities has not yet been captured at the local level. Subpart F is program requirements um, and contains the following. These, again, are things that you should be familiar with, especially if you run a supportive housing program grant. That is match, housing quality standards, how you calculate rent and occupancy charges, uh, limitations on the use of funds, timeliness standards, and other federal requirements, including fair housing requirements. Subpart G contains uh, specific standards regarding the types of records that recipients and subrecipients must keep and that HUD will review when we come out to monitor. Standards for grant and project changes, in other words, what constitutes uh, a change that will um, trigger a grant amendment. Sanctions and closeout procedures. So let's take a moment to talk about and highlight some of the key terms that appear in the continuum of care rule and that you will need to have uh, sort of in your mind as you begin to walk through the 2012 competition and registration notices. The first is the continuum of care itself. This is very similar to what we've had in the past. It really just is more formalized. It's the large community-based group that has um, stakeholders that are representative of various types of, of organizations and people. So it really is the group of representatives of organizations, including nonprofits, victim service providers, faith-based organizations, local government, um, businesses, advocates, PHAs, school districts, again, all of these folks who really have an interest in preventing and ending homelessness, um, and that they are organized to carry out the responsibilities required under this part. You can read through the, the list uh, yourself on the slide and in the regulation, but you, I think, get the general gist of, um, of what we're doing there. We also use the term applicant in a few different 
contexts. And the first is just the term applicant itself. An applicant means um, an eligible applicant that has been designated by the continuum of care to apply for assistance. In other words, it's a project applicant. That concept is not very different than what uh, we have done in the past. Then it goes a step further to a collaborative applicant, which is the eligible applicant that has been designated by the continuum to apply for a grant for COC planning funds uh, on behalf of the continuum of care. This is really the what we used to call the lead agency. And this lead agency not only sub submits the application on behalf of the continuum of care, but also must be the, the applicant for planning funds. So that's the collaborative applicant. And unified funding agency means an eligible applicant that is selected by the continuum of care to apply for a grant for the entire continuum of care, which has, and the organization must have the capacity to carry out the duties of the UFA, which um, the citation for the regulation is right there. It has to be approved by HUD, and HUD will award a grant that includes planning dollars and program dollars to that UFA. It's important to note that we are not implementing the UFA, uh, UFAs in 2012. In the 2012 competition, uh, we do need to do some additional work to ensure that agencies that are designated as UFAs um, have the ability and the capacity to carry out the uh, standards that are set forth in the rule. These terms, again, should be familiar to you. To determine a continuum's maximum award amount, the continuum, as always, must claim all of its geographic area through the continuum of care registration process. Each geographic area, as you know, is associated with a dollar amount, and that is determined by a formula which is described in Part 578.17 of the regulation. The dollar amounts for each geographic area that it claims are summed up together to determine the preliminary pro rata need for the continuum of care. So that is the same as what we have do been doing in the past. The next one I mentioned in the opening of this presentation, and that is renewal demand. Formerly, hold harmless need, renewal demand is determined by listing all of the projects that are eligible for renewal in a given year through the continuum of care program competition. It includes both what were formerly shelter plus care and uh, supportive housing program grants. Final pro rata need, or FPRN, is the higher of the two numbers, either preliminary pro rata need or renewal demand. Again, these concepts are fairly similar to what we've done in the past, but some of the terminology has changed. A continuum's maximum award amount is the final pro rata need plus any additional eligible amounts for things like continuum of care planning dollars or UFA costs, adjustments that are made to the leasing, operating, and rental assistance line items based on changes to the fair market rent in any given year, as well as any bonuses that are provided in that year's competition. Next, to talk about the competition process for 2012, I will turn it over to Laura. Thank you, Anne. The following information is intended to provide the continuum of care and project applicants with an overview on how the continuum of care regulations have affected the application process. But first, keep in mind, the process is essentially the same as the previous competitions. The continuum of care application has been expanded to capture the new requirements as outlined in the act. The process will begin with the grant inventory worksheets followed by the continuum care re registration, as it always has been for the past several years, and then the release of the FY 2012 continuum care NOFA that will begin the application period. This year, more emphasis will be placed on the grant inventory worksheets due to the changes required by the continuum care program rule. It is imperative that COCs work closely with project applicants to ensure the information is accurate and all the renewing grants, including the first-time renewals, are included. A COC's annual renewal demand is determined by the renewals listed on the grant inventory worksheet, and if one or more renewals are missing, this can affect the COC's ability to submit new projects or affect all renewals receiving funding. 
as in past competitions. COCs that intend to submit an application must complete the registration process. And the COC's registration must be approved by HUD in order to gain access to the COC application once the competition opens. The continuum of care application has been expanded, as we said, to capture the new requirements, but we wanted to let you know that more information on the new requirements will be provided in future broadcasts. Project applicants will continue to complete and submit the required information and documents that are part of the SF-424. The most notable change for project applicants is that we will no longer have the applications available for the supportive housing program or the shelter plus care project applications. Both COC and project applicants will have access to the applicant profile that must be, remain updated as changes are made to key personnel listed. The COC applicant profile has moved to the registration process and the project applicant profile remains with the application process. As mentioned in previous broadcast, the application profile is available for update at any time during the year. Finally, the most notable change is that you will not be able to import from the previous year's information in the FY 2012 competition due to the changes implemented by the Act. Based on the continuing care interim regulations, COCs will need to provide information on the current operations and structure and how the continuum will meet the requirements as outlined in the Act. HMIS, as a reminder, COCs are ultimately responsible for HMIS activity and should ensure that the HMIS lead agency follows the regulations that are provided in the documents published by HUD. Additional objectives have been added to reflect the performance measures. COCs should, if not already, ensure coordination with the local ESG programs and projects and provide information as needed to the jurisdiction's consolidated planning process. As in past competitions, the COCs will be required to attach the consolidated plan certification for consistency form that contains all the submitted project applications and signed by the appropriate authorized person for the jurisdiction. And the attachments, with the changes in the act, the COC applicants will need to attach additional application related documents based on uh, answers that, uh, that are attached to the questions in the application. More information will be provided in the application and the NOFA as to what attachments will need to be added in your application. Additional information and details will be provided to the Continuum of Care Registration Notice and the Continuum of Care NOFA, included detailed instructions, training modules, and frequently asked questions. The most notable change for the project applicants will be the removal of the Supportive Housing Program and Shelter Plus Care Program, as these programs have been consolidated into one funding opportunity. Project applicants will now have the choices of the following. Permanent housing, as Ann mentioned earlier, this includes permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing. Permanent supportive housing must include services. Transitional housing is the same concept as it always has been. Supportive services only includes the coordinated and centralized intake. HMIS, an expanded application to capture information for the dedicated project. And please note this on safe havens. Under the HEARTH Act, HUD can no longer fund new safe haven projects. However, existing safe haven projects can be renewed. Please note to be considered for funding, a submission of an application is required. As with the continuum care applications, additional information, training, and guidance will be provided when the continuum care NOFA is released later this year. Reallocation is open to all COCs. In past year's competition, the continuum of care was allowed to reallocate SHP renewal projects. Now, 
that, that uh, now it should be noted that the SHP and Shelter Plus Care projects have been combined and COC should review all projects to determine if consistently per poor performing projects need to be reallocated to create new projects. Another good thing about the continuum of care and project applications will appreciate is guidance on the differences between rental assistance and leasing. The provision of the directions are, of, are imperative to you because both leasing, under which was SHP, and rental assistance, which was under Shelter Plus Care, are eligible costs under the new continuum of care program. As this is a very in, uh, important distinction, upcoming guidance can be used to help guide the transition process. More will be provided in future communications. We strongly encourage everyone to visit the HUD HRE and download the copy of the Continuum Care Interim Rule. We also recommend that you read through all the materials and the frequently asked questions before submitting your questions. If your question has not been addressed, please submit it to the virtual help desk as we always have in the past. Your questions will be processed in the same manner as it has been during the, same, as the previous competitions. Thank you for joining us and please stay tuned for upcoming broadcasts and webinars. Thank you.